Hello guys and welcome back to the Motor Recon Podcast. I'm your host Adam. I'm joined again today by Rob. Um, first of all, and what we're going to talk about, because I've seen it a lot around on the internet recently, is the brand new Jaguar F-Type. Well, I say brand new. The faceless yeah, it's the face Jaguar lift, F-Type. Yeah. A lot of controversy that I've seen around online regarding this. A lot of hate, but also a lot of love. So we're going to go through and talk about sort of our opinion of this and what we think and a few technical bits about the car, uh, and then we're going to move on to another topic after. So just first of all, initial impressions, what do you think? Mixed bag. Mixed bag? Mixed bag, yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to obviously go into some of the details as to why, it, but I mean, I personally feel it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, this is something that we have known has been coming for a little while. We've seen the spy yeah. photos for the new F-Type. Um, and we've also seen some uh, pictures of a potential mid-engine replacement for the F-Type. Yeah, which I think will be well. very interesting to see. I think that that would be, given Jag's new sort of direction of trying to get ahead of the game, like with the I-Pace, I can certainly see them getting themselves into the market of like a baby mid engine Basically, it's a baby 570. Yeah, I'd agree on that. Um, so and yeah, I think that'll work. And when that does come out, that'll be great. So I think this one initially is just going to be the end of the run for this type of F-Type. Yeah. It's going to run it out and see it until a complete new replacement coming in. I think it's around two years, two to three years yeah. probably. Yeah. Um, my initial impressions, honestly, are very good. I, I love the way this car looks. I can't deny that. I think, I, I wouldn't say it's an improvement at all. I'd just say it's another very good looking car. This is, the, this is why it's a mixed bag because in my opinion, they've not ruined it. Not by no. a long shot. It's not like it's gone disgustingly ugly. No, I, yeah. I just think it's lost some of its unique personality. That's all. It's yeah. brought it in line with their range, but I've heard online quite a lot, obviously, people comparing it to Audi at the front end. Yeah, and, and I can, you see, can the, see it. The headlights in particular, not so much the grill and whatnot, but the headlights particularly, I think, look quite tt uh, And if I'm being honest, the first thing that it reminded me of, the way that the front end is rounded and with the narrow headlamps, it reminded me a little bit of the Tesla Model S. Okay. It's sort of that rounded front end with the slim headlamps. And I think that's the trouble. It's quite... A, that's, it's more... A it's generic. generic. A generic. It's generic, yeah. isn't it? It's out of the box. This what, is... While I agree, I'm not disagreeing with you on that at all, I do think it, they have made it look a tiny bit more, um, like you said, generic with other, other brands and things. I can't help but like it. Well, the one thing you can tell, um, I'd thoroughly recommend doing this, by the way, is someone has put out a fantastic sort of side-by-side -side profile of Alden Noop, and you can immediately tell that without actually lowering the car at all, the profile of the car has very much visually been lowered by taking those headlamps down. Yeah, it has. And also the front grille's got... What, well, wider is in from top to bottom. I think it's bigger. Yeah. And I also think it extends towards the edge of the car slightly more because the, the bits around it between the headlight and the grille are slightly thinner. Yeah, the intakes for the radiators and whatever have been sort of reprofiled. Mm. Um, now, I've actually got a bit of an opinion on this one, which is uh, the reason why I like the original F-Type is because I think it pays quite strong homage to the design that Jaguar has had throughout history. Yeah. Although the redesign um, is obviously in line with new Jaguar, their entire new Jaguar range, and I don't mind it at all, I just think that the old one was less aggressive. Now, some people think that's a bad thing, as in people prefer their sports cars to be aggressive, but if you look at Jag's history and their design of their... So I'm not talking about their special sort of SVR. No, you're yeah, just the more. I'm talking the, about the, your, the bog standard, your bog standard ones. stuff. So I'm going to take you through a journey of the past, and you'll see what I'm on about. Yeah. So I'm going to talk at the XK to begin with. Obviously launched in 2006. So I'm talking about the launch variant with no special modifications. Yeah, to just it. your bog standard six cylinder. Yeah. XK. yeah, we've talked. Well, it actually, this one was a V8. Um, was it a hang up? Yeah, it was a V8. Oh, did, was it a V6 yeah. they did later? Or did I, think, I don't know if they even uh, put a V6 in this one, but um, straight out of the box, people thought that it was one of the prettiest cars of all time. And I think the design has held up spectacular. Yeah, I would agree as well. It's gorgeous. It's not aggressive. No, it's very round. It's very round, but just pretty. Hmm. I said did see that obviously this is excluding like you say the R ones and the things exactly like that. yeah that's what I'm talking about yeah because uh, even the generation before the SK before was a very pretty car <coughs> not aggressive not aggressive until you got up to like you say your R's because I saw an R, I saw an XKR yesterday at the uh, Land Rover dealer it was all black with black wheels and it just looked very sinister and very sort of it was very aggressive but it was the R 
Uh, but that's my point. Yeah. Um, and then obviously going even further back into history, obviously looking at the E-type where all of this started, yeah. you look at a Series 1 E-type, it is by no means an aggressive car. Sure, no. design back then wasn't particularly aggressive, but I think that the F-Type paid fantastic homage to its forebearers yeah. by being that less intimidating car. Yeah, very round yeah. and very, very sort of welcoming is the way you think you phrased it before, wasn't it? It's so. just very picturesque, though. Yeah. And I think, truthfully as well, I think that a less aggressive design probably ages better. It does, for sure. Yeah. And I, I would agree. I think, to be honest, I, the XK, for me, one of my favourite looking cars... Um, of, of over the past maybe 20 years or so um, even longer than that I'd say and I'd say from the generation of the E-Type that was my best looking car from that era Yeah, I think so I think yeah with this one I can see why you would think that they've obviously gone for the slightly more aggressive front end mm -hmm. me personally I do like an aggressive look I don't mind it at all um, but I do think perhaps they should have maybe evolved the back end a bit more to fit with the front because they've kind of left the back as it was yeah, and this is the thing. Um, a lot of the argument comes down to, do you think the new one looks better than the old one overall? No. And but... for me, no. I don't dislike it, but at the same token, I would see this as a perfect opportunity for me to buy into the old one. Yeah. Well, if you, well, I know you're in the market for something like that, so if you do, I think you should. I, because, as you say, I always liked the design of the old one, and I'm very curious to see how history looks upon both of these cars as to whether the people look back on the F-Type and revere the first generation, or whether they revere the facelift as far as yeah. in 10, 20 years down the line. I'm, furious to, I'm curious to see which one will have aged better. I honestly think the Gen 1 will have aged better, just like you say, because it is more round and those sort of that things do seem team, seem to go better. I also think it holds a more special place in people's hearts, so it would just naturally become the one that's the preferred option. And I might add as well, obviously this leads nicely into the next topic that we're going to be discussing about the F-Type. The first gen will always be associated with the preferred spec, which arguably was the V6 with a manual. Yeah. The new facelift doesn't come with a manual option, nor does it ever come with a six part. You can get it with either the standard sort of five liter supercharged V8, which is getting, let's be honest, really quite long in the tooth now, or you can get it with their four part, which yeah. obviously is relatively unchanged from the old the old model moving over. Yeah, and it's had a lot of criticism for dropping the six cylinder, to be honest. Yes, it which has. Which I have seen a lot of them online on forums or even on just it on was Facebook. The, for a lot of people, it was the preferred model. Yeah. Just, not just because you could get it with the uh, manual gearbox. Obviously, that's a big factor for a lot of car guys. But also because, again, paying history to Jag on the haul... Jags belong with six parts. Yeah, you they do. Look, you look at the E-Type where all this started. It started with a straight six. Yeah. Now, Jag have a new straight six. They do. They do have a new straight six. But I heard that the reason why this straight six isn't in the facelift is because they couldn't fit it. Yeah, it simply does not fit in the car. You can see the logic of this because obviously, God, if you take yourself back to 2013 or whatever, when the original F-Type launched, it launched with V-formation engines. Yeah. You could either get it with a V6 or you could either get it with a V8. So it's block, you know, yeah. relatively compact compared to a straight six, for example. Now, although further down the line, um, they did incorporate an inline engine, the inline four, but I think that's as, obviously that's like half a V8. Yeah, and also as well, it's, it's that bit shorter again. You've got two. Yeah, you've got two knocked off. Two knocked off. So, yeah, I think I, I can see it from that logical point of view, and we were discussing sort of off mic that this might be leading into when the F-Type gets fully replaced with a new model. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it'll be called. It might be an F-Type. It could be something else because... They tend to change the yeah. letters as the, the G type. Comes. Yeah, it could be, could could be, be anything. We don't yeah. know, don't we? So, um, like I say, that they might specifically design that car around it, and like they have done with the Range Rover Sport, put that engine with a hybrid system. Yeah, which would make sense. No, and that's the thing. So obviously, we're going to have a quick nausea now at Jag's new um, inline six-cylinder, um, and we're going to discuss a little bit more about. Obviously, it has a mild hybrid system. Something that we've, se you know, it's something that fascinates me because it wasn't actually um, anything I foresaw. No, 
I didn't foresee this coming, but it seems as f especially with your premium brands such as I know Merck have a mild hybrid six pot. Yeah. I know that it's also Jag a, have one. is also a straight six, is Merck. And I also know that Audi have introduced a mild hybrid system as well. So um, let's uh, if I'm having a quick nausea at this new straight six from JLR, it's currently in the Range Rover Sport. Yeah. Um, so you can actually get the figures for it. Again, obviously, inline six cylinders, turbocharged unit with a 48 volt mild hybrid system. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's actually up as well power wise. It is. From the last. So the V6 was 375 brake and this one's 395. So 20 extra. 20 extra 20 ponies. 20 extra ponies there. And obviously, it. It get, but also along with that you get better efficiency Land Rover are quoting between 24.5 and 26.7 mpg now that's that's in a Range Rover yeah exactly if yeah. you put that in a much lighter much lower much more aerodynamic F-type yeah. or F-type replacement you could easily get into the 30s so this has obviously been a case of making that bridge between old world and obviously in the new electric world um now, I did watch a review relatively recently on one of the Audis that has their new mild hybrid system. And one of the things that fascinated me about it was obviously you use this mild hybrid system to fill power gaps. So obviously, yeah. like in the JLR one, it's an electric supercharger. So that's interesting. But um, I saw in the Audi, it really helped with their start-stop technology. Yeah. Traditionally, you have to be at a standstill, take the car out of gear or whatever, and then obviously the engine yeah. will cut out. This Audi obviously means that when you're coasting up to a set of lights, the engine will cut out while you're still moving. Yeah, and just use the electric. It's a brilliant idea. It, it does honestly make complete sense. And it's kind of exciting to see this coming in. Also, Jaguar actually doing something about it. Because let's face it, in terms of cash-wise, they're a lot down on the German rivals. Sure, yeah. They don't sell the numbers they do. They don't make the sheer quantity of cars they do. So for them to be actually... Because they are natural rivals of the Germans in that sense. The Merck, your Beamers, your Exactly. No, Audis. they occupy the same market as the German Yeah, and they're also priced, yeah. priced fairly sort of competitively with them as well. So sure. they've got to do this in order to actually be in line with them. And showcasing it in a Range Rover as well I think shows the capabilities because it's a big heavy car needs a lot of torque actually the torque as well is up from the old system so it was 339 foot pounds before or pounds feet and it's now 406 pounds feet of torque now, so, which is good for off-roading is that this will be the death of the V8 Oh, 100% as in as far as in your big saloons and sort of your fast yeah, yeah. 4x4s these mild hybrid six parts, which people seem to be going for, the, I get it. These premium, these premium companies have decided to develop these to phase out their V8s. One of the other sort of suggestions I heard online about the new F-Type, for example, was obviously it's still got that old school five liter V8 in it. They're saying that maybe one of the other reasons why they didn't work sort of maybe harder to get these six parts in there is because they just want to get rid of the V8 units. Yeah, just sell them. Just while sell can. them while they can, or just get rid of them. Sort of get them out of the way, whatever five yeah. liter V eights they've got, so then they can focus on building new cars with this new technology. In. Yeah, and it, from a business point of view, that makes sense. It does. Yeah, it will also maybe trigger people to go and buy one, thinking, "Hang on a minute, this isn't going to be around for very long." So if I want a V eight car, this is going to have to be my opportunity, which I think a lot of people are getting used to anyway, because they are fading out from everyone. Yeah, um, and also with the new global warming and everything all the trends going out for that it's just well, something that's going to be dying it's a mixture of a lot of things obviously with the trend for obviously people trying to be more environmentally conscious obviously people wanting more economy um you're looking at as well obviously with the wltp test replacing the old system and being far more realistic to what a car actually achieves yeah. the you want to produce engines that are more I tell you what, just on the side, this is slightly unrelated, but it's only a two-second thing. I was watching a uh, proper long-distance road trip um, from Harry Metcalf. People know he is very well known uh, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually works at JLR. Okay. Um, but he did a long-term sort of lo long drive in a McLaren GT. Yes, I saw that in the V8, yeah. and he actually calculated as well. So it wasn't the car telling him this. He calculated from what he put in to what it used and everything, and he averaged over 30 mpg, and that's in a McLaren. And also got all his clothes and got everything in, all that kind of stuff. So if they can get this system up and running, there's no saying that in an F-Type, which is lighter, probably not than the McLaren, but lighter than like, the Range Rovers, this could do close to 40. And unlike the McLaren, does have some hybrid technology to help it along. Oh, yeah, exactly. I think 40 mile per gallon is very much achievable. Exactly. And I think 
it is filling that gap. And I think, obviously, it's allowing them to satisfy... I do. I think it would be really beneficial in the F-type replacement to put something like this in there because it satisfies your old world people. Because take a, you think of your traditional Jaguar customers who may not be overly sold on electric technology at the moment. Straight sixes sound great. Yeah. Um, it also pays massive homage to Jag's history, given that pretty much the greatest cars they've ever made have been straight sixes. Yeah. So, and you're also satisfying an improved economy and sort of emissions yeah, regulations for the modern world because you drop in those two cylinders. I'm not, I wouldn't be at all surprised, sort of 10 years down the line, you're going to be finding this mild hybrid technology attached to four parts and then inline threes. What's well, so it, 10 years down the line? I, or maybe I this can, is yeah. all irrelevant. Yeah, and I we've can. Moved ten by that ten point. years is a long time in this world. Yeah. Okay. Maybe scale that back. Maybe call it in five years' time. Yeah. Maybe they'll be phasing these straight sixes with mild hybrid technology out, and we'll be going for inline fours with a bit of mild hybrid, well, you, or more likely they'll go for an inline three. Yeah. Well, the thing I can say is, well, it wasn't that long ago where four hundred horsepower out of a V eight was un- like stretching it yeah and already heard of like you get you can get 400 horsepower out of two liter four pots now yeah sure comfortable unless it's only get, getting 395 but it's not the point it's quite a lot of torque in this engine but I, I i can see that happening five to six years time but you know this sort of stuff always to and you know it always reminds me of one thing and it takes me right back to it it reminds me of and i know this sounds weird but the bmw i8 yeah just how ahead of a time ahead of its time it was Oh, yeah. Because that's an inline three-cylinder with hybrid technology. By the time other sports cars are coming out with that kind of technology, how long ago will the i8 have come out? It'll be like well over, what is it? It'll be well over a decade. Yeah, yeah. That's how much it will have been I don't think it's far off a decade. Now, I can't remember the exact year of release, but it won't be that far away. And interestingly, speaking of design, I saw an i8 in the real world all not that long ago, and it still looks as futuristic and fantastic as the day it rolled out of the factory. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, it has been facelifted a little bit, but even still, the Gen 1s Even the Gen 1s they still look great. Fantastic. Yeah, no, I'd agree. Um, I think that's a good place to sort of wrap that one up there. Obviously, let us know what you think about the new F type. It is a bit of a controversial topic at the yeah. minute, from what I can tell. Um, so, we're just going to quickly move on to another one now. Because if you remember a few episodes ago, what we did, we picked a car that we didn't really like uh, and sort of see if we could spec it in a way that would make us think, hang on a minute. You know, it's not that bad or... We, we would if, give it a we, second we it a glance. We would actually... Yeah, yeah, so the last one was the Ford Eco Sport. Uh, this one is sort of along the similar thing, but slightly bigger. So it's the new Nissan Juke. Now, neither of us, it's fair to say, were a fan of the old one. That's putting it a little mildly. mildly. We, yeah. we we didn't like. I think the thing about the old one we didn't like largely was the styling. We yeah. thought it was fussy and overblown. It was also it also had an engine that was way too small for the size of the car. It was a little one point six with no power, and it just didn't move. Yeah, but the new one. While the the looks are improved quite significantly, I would say. Agreed. S- big big time over the old one. I'm still not a huge fan. It's still too fussy for me. Yeah, they're trying too much. I think it's the a lot of Japanese manufacturers are doing it now, except for Mazda, perhaps. They're going for the very angular sort of multiple loads uh, of lines and bits and bobs around. Now, you're saying except Mazda because you look at the difference between the Mark III MX-5 and the later Mark IV that came out in 2015. Actually, it was a lot more angular. It's it? a lot more angular mm. and angry. So, But that being said, I think the new... We, obviously, you prefer the Mark III's looks, don't you? Whereas I prefer Only the, the exterior, obviously. But, yeah, I do. Whereas, it, but, again, very spec dependent. Yeah, because as you say, I think the Mark IV MX-5 with its angular design I actually quite like it Dog, oh, I love it yeah. don't get me wrong but I p- p- personally just prefer the Mark, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mark 3 so this one this and Duke for those of you who aren't familiar with it it's a, sort of what you call it a small crossover built in the UK and probably somewhere else in yeah in, I'm sure built in other factories other around factories. I think the world, Japan yeah. is also in, yeah. in America perhaps um, it is probably sort of the rival for like um, it is probably Ford Eco Sports and your Toyota, your CR, Toyota CZR CR, or whatever, or whatever. Called, we covered yeah. it in an earlier yeah, and episode and I'd anyway. even say it's a rival for the Nissan Qashqai which is it's own it's, you know, sort of sibling I was about to say that it is one of those things where I've n- 
You know how obviously the idea is being brands, there are distinct differences between your cars. Yeah. This is one of those occasions where I struggle to see the difference between the cash car and the. Surely the. It's the, the, it's the engines. Is it the it's engines? It's literally the engines because the, the cash car can tow a heavier weight. It's got more engine options, as in more power and things to make caravan or something like that. So this is more on the sportier side. Yeah, this isn't is it? for your. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Hit more hipster type. If we're talking really SUV, sure. the sort of the cash car is more you. And this is more S. Yeah. Basically. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I'd, I'd agree on that. So what I think, we'll go with this one. The, the prices from these cars actually in the UK anyway start at 17 and a half grand. Very reasonable. Which is, for the size of car you're getting and what you actually get with it. Very reasonable. Very reasonable. So the thing we didn't like most of all was the looks. So what we tried to do was spec the exterior to something that we would maybe find more appealing. Mm -hmm. So this actually, again, like the Ford EcoSport, it has a two-tone option. Perfect. Yeah, and we've done that. We, we seem to have the common consensus that on cars that sit quite high, we like to give them sort of like a dark roof. Yeah, it brings the roof brings line down, it brings down. the size of the car down. The ca and yeah. I'm, that's why, obviously, I'm fairly certain this is what the car companies also think as well, because this is becoming... That's why they're giving it the quite a lot, aren't Range they? Rovers do it. Even, yeah. on the, even on the full-size Range Rovers, they do it. So I, I think it's coming along that. So the model we picked was the uh, Tecna. T E K N A plus. Yeah. I'm guessing that stands for technical navigation or something. Yeah, because as standard, this comes with quite a lot of kit. It does, well, this, this is, from what I could tell, the top spec one that is actually available. Now, the reason we picked this is because the exterior, again, was the two tone option. You also got maybe like a slightly more sporty body kit on it and, and colours here and there. So just give it that. Give it that little bit of an extra pizzazz over the standard one. Yeah. Which appeals to us in a, in a way. On the car, this dull normally. Mm hmm. So. Colours we picked, two-tone, burgundy with a pearl black roof and door mirrors. So mm -hmm. the door mirrors are also black. That's £170 optional extra. I think it's well worth that money. It is, just for that. Now, th this actual model we've picked starts at 25295 so it's a significant step up from the 17 However... But you get everything. I might add as well, where does the Fiesta max out? Uh, for the ST3, 20, I spec one with everything on it is 25, 8 or 20. Because I thought, I thought the Fiesta maxed out at 20 odd grand. So yeah. when you consider. Uh, it is a very different car. Uh, but I also might add, though, I mean, if you're. if I'm thinking of this from a family man's perspective. Yeah, right? That's a five door ST, I must add. Yeah, okay. Well. I just didn't think it was that bad value for money. To no, be I, I don't. The, no. I mean, don't get me wrong, this will not drive anywhere near as well. It will no, not be no. as fast, and also you'll look a bit of a burk in it, but that's just obviously opinions. Um, so what we did pick, we've gone for the Enigma black leather with Alcantara seat. Yeah. Now, Alcantara and leather in a car of this price, I know leather's pretty much standard, but Alcantara in a car of this price bracket is not bad. We both commented that we both really like the interior on this one, actually. Yeah, that is a big, big step up over the it, old one. It had like an Alcantara dashboard, which I, I don't actually see all that much of, to be honest. You no, see unless you're looking of... like, I think McLaren have it all Alcantara most of the time, as Ferrari, I think, have it as an option, and Lamborghini, but there you obviously mega high and stuff this is a nissan yeah yeah um but again not bad that's a standard we didn't actually pick that as an option but we liked it mm -hmm. anyway um other personalization so we've got for the interior polarization pack which was enigma black so it basically darkens everything down yeah uh, it also has the um privacy glass at the back uh, again i think that rear. helps take the height down a it little does. bit and also like, it just gives people in the back a little bit more privacy i know it's not really a big deal but you can also put some on the back seats and stop people seeing it as easily. Yeah. Um, I've used it for mine. I can put a bag on the back seat and outside you can't see through it unless you literally get your yeah, head on Yeah, whereas it. I have no privacy glass whatsoever. Yeah, but you don't have rear doors. It's not really an issue for you, is it? it do you know, it kind of suits my personality as well because obviously I like your older, more simple designs, to be honest, quite often. They're yeah. not tinted out, no, are no, they? And you know? Yeah, that's all, all comes down to preference. But this comes with it as standard. Yeah, I didn't pack. mind it, not at all. No, no. Uh, The 19-inch Akari alloy wheels, mm. um, design-wise, very nice, actually, um, as alloy wheels go. Some would say it's probably a bit fussy. Um but I quite like them myself. I, I have nothing against them, largely because although they are quite fussy, they are quite dark. Yeah, well, the silver bits and black bits... That's the, what the, I mean. The black bits obviously make it look a bit less less fussy. But on a car that, again, what a lot of people would probably find quite dull, mm. it does just draw your eyes to it and just give it a bit more of a... Gives you know, a bit more a bit pizzazz, more pizzazz, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, which is, is nice. We've also, again, a standard on this particular model comes with a comfort pack, design pack, 
Pro Pilot Pack Heat Pack and the Bose Personal Plus audio system. Believe me, it has more options on it. That this is why I think it's quite good value for twenty five grand. Because as far as creature comforts are concerned on the inside, you aren't left wanting. No, well, like, the comfort pack comes with these stands like heated heated seats, heated steering wheels, all that kind of stuff, and obviously your comfier seats. It's got your design pack to make it look more stylish, as in two-tone bits here and there, your Alcantara's and your leathers. With the Pro Pilot pack, that was like your intelligent cruise controls and your sat-navs and all that parking itself, uh, gubbins. Uh, heat packs, obvious again, what that is. Yeah, no, as in um, it really, it had everything that you would want. To be yeah. honest, so and the, I bet, I bet that Bose audio system is very good. Oh yeah, Bo- it'll Bose be perfectly gen- good. Bose generally are very good. It'll be perfectly uh, in, good. In the sound world. Yeah. Um, few little things. Obviously, it's got a seven-speed uh, gearbox. We went for the manual, but we option. did go for the manual, which is six. It was cheaper. It, it was. It, yeah, was, cheaper it was cheaper for the manual, but that, that's usually the case. I think it's changing more now. Uh, the, the only difference is it's a it's a one litre, which in a car this big. Well, let's have a quick nausea at what power we're sticking out then. So if you scroll up, I think we've got. Uh, was it? Yeah. So it's uh, hang on, it's only 116 emissions. Actually, that's good. Yeah, that fuel consumption is not very good, is it? No, but if you look at the combined WLTP, yeah, it's 50... 44.1. That's the combined down at the bottom. Mm-hmm. So it could be better, but it is a big car, I guess. It's a big car, and I might also add as well, um, fuel consumption figures seem to be more realistic now with the WLTP test. Yeah. So clearly, they've made some amendments to the test to make them more real to life, which isn't a bad thing for. I think, I think they were forced to, weren't Yeah, they? it's not a bad thing. So one thing it doesn't do is actually give us the... Um, oh, 117 horsepower, there we are. Yeah, 117 horsepower, which in a car this big... Well, look, you probably... If this you find is, this, it's not for speed. No, but that's being said, though, because it is meant to be a little bit more sporty, though. Actually, yeah, I suppose. This is meant to be the more well, sporty this is, variant. This is, I've driven the old Duke, to be fair, and the one thing I did criticise it for at the time was not having enough power. Yeah. It's a big, heavy-ish car, and even then it had a 1.6. I don't know what the power output was on it, uh, which just borrowed it from somebody, and it didn't move. You could put your foot down and nothing happened for a long time. I think this will suffer from the similar sort of similar sort of problem. So, essentially, with, when all was said and done, and obviously we'd spec'd it to the way that we wanted to, we came to the total price of 25465 quid. My question is, is there anything you would have for that cash? In this category, Com- or just in, generally? In this category, yeah. Ooh, you see, now, looks-wise, I would probably go for a cash car, but I think it's slightly... It would be a lower spec than this, obviously, to get it into that price bracket, but I'd still probably have it. I mean... Let's be real here. This category isn't something that SUVs are not our favourite cars in the world. No. So I don't think either of us would be parting with our well, actual I, money for an SUV. I wouldn't even consider soon. this an SUV. It's a small crossover, isn't it? Really. Yeah. I mean, it, it it doesn't work off road. It doesn't work on the road. It's just a little crossover thing, which a lot of people seem to buy them. You do see them everywhere. So. For my 25 grand, what I'd actually be buying is I'd be buying a probably either a Focus. Yeah. A Biofocus or maybe a Golf. I know that yeah. sounds boring. No, but, but if, it, if let's face it, if you're buying this car, you are no, not interested in cars. You're not interested or, in the way they drive and they're not interested in the way they look. Actually, if you like this Japanese angular styling and you want to go with a Japanese mark, I'd actually buy a Civic. Yeah, if that was if that if was it was your... my money and I wanted to go down this Japanese angular styling route, I'd probably get a Civic for that kind of cash. Yeah, I'd probably agree. And as like you say, the other things you'd probably consider in because they just these don't have much space inside. I will criticise them for that. I've been inside one. And the the room is not good for a car this big. The you... boot's not massive. Uh, other than a higher, slightly higher driving position, it has nothing going for it. Do you know that's something that quite a lot of modern saloons are getting slated for these days because they all have an extremely sloping roofline, which looks good. Well, my but a, my the, A3 had the same issue. You, your head hit the thing in the back, and it didn't have much room. Yeah, I think didn't I have to sort of detach my head to get yeah. in there? Yeah, which. I know it's a different type of car, but this doesn't suffer from the headroom issue. I'll give no, you that. well, again, because it's sort of like a four sloping roof line. Yeah. If you look at it, it's obviously the dark colours, so obviously the window slopes down, but the roof actually carries yeah. on straight out, much like the Mac E that yeah. we looked at. Obviously, yeah. I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, so to me, yeah, probably something like a Focus Golf or even like you say a Civic if you, if you do you're want into the from styling, the Japanese yeah. cars. Yeah, that for me would be my choice over these. No questions asked. Yeah. And you can get all three of them cars at some variant within this price range. And not to mention as well, they're all as practical as one another because none of them can off-road. That's fine. 
I mean, that's yeah, neither just can a fact. This. this can't tow anything. It's got 117 horsepower, one litre engine. Exactly. So neither can the rest of them. Well, if you get a two litre diesel in a Focus or a two litre diesel in a Golf, you'll comfortably pull a small caravan or trailer. And but I also think as well, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, and again, I think as if you are looking, because if you're looking at the Duke, you do have some sort of inclination of sportiness because that, to yeah. spec it the way we did, you do have some level of sportiness on your mind. So you would probably want to go for the Civic, for example, with the one liter is a good handling car. Yeah, or the, the new fo Focus, the Focus is, is a, a great good handling car. Good handling car. So yeah, yeah. I, I would agree on that. So I think that'd be a good place to wrap it up. Wrap that up there. Um, obviously, again. Anything, any feedback or any topics you want us to discuss, let us know in the comments below, uh, or I'll leave links to all social media and you can contact us that way. Um, but until then, we will see you next week. Yeah, see you later. Right, thank you very much. Bye-bye.